Hi everyone, my name is Pierre. I'm going to talk about learning, vision, language, and control from play. And this is work uh, with Corey, Rostan, Mohi, Ted, Vikash, Jonathan, Sergey, and myself at Robotics at Google and X. So this workshop is asking the question, how do we get a breakthrough in video learning? So towards that goal, I would like to maybe rephrase that a little bit and ask the question, how do we scale up video learning? Should we invest more in uh, supervised learning? Should we invest more in multimodal learning? And our answer to this, these questions is to use robotics. Um, and in particular, use uh, weak uh, supervision and self-supervision and use uh, high uh, highly multimodal uh, signals. And for example, in this, uh, in this talk, we'll present work where we jointly learn uh, control, vision, and language using a single model and with small amounts of supervision. So before we dive into the robotics side, I want to shine uh, uh, lights a bit more on the types of domains that we typically choose when we do uh, self-supervision. Um, what are the trade-offs that between scale, so that's the y-axis, and uh, modality? Um, what learning efficiency do we get uh, for different trade-offs? So for example, is it better to learn at a gigantic scale only from monocular vi videos? Or is it better to learn at an intermediate scale, but with more modalities? So I would argue that both directions are valid, but I think the robotic setting has a higher learning efficiency. Um, so for example, here, if you start going on the more multimodal axis, if you add uh, actions to monocular videos. Uh, you may have a uh, smaller scale, but you will have uh, starting to have a richer supervision signal. Um, you can also add, start adding depth, uh, multi-view videos, tactile feedback, force feedback, or even uh, language, or even eventually teacher interactions. So interactions from a robot and human, for example. So being at this uh, far right end of that graph, I'm arguing that this is give, giving us a lot more uh, juice and much more learning efficiency, even though we are at a smaller scale than the YouTube scale. Um, and also we can learn things that you cannot learn just from monocular videos. So things like you know texture, like friction of objects in the world, the world these kind of things. Um, and another advantage to uh, using robotics is that the benchmarks that you can use are more clear-cut metrics. So uh, you, can, you can ask things like, did you or did you not succeed at doing this task? Um, whereas in vision, sometimes we struggle to find the right metric or the right threshold for, let's say, bounding box, IOU, IOU thresholds, or even, you know, is the bounding box really... Uh, the right metric, the right thing to measure. Uh, maybe we care more about knowing if you perform a task, or it, it tells more about how much you understand about objects, for example. Um, finally, I would argue that when collection methods are cheap, or even better, autonomous, uh, then the robotic um, data can very rapidly scale to huge amounts. So eventually, we may get the best of both worlds, where we have YouTube scale data, but also more multimodal data, thanks to robotics, when uh, we get more deployments. Um, so even I would say even at the current scale uh, of data we have, because there's more learning opportunity, opportunities, um, on the right side of the graph, I would encourage the vision community to consider uh, more the robotics uh, environments uh, for benchmarks. And these aren't really new ideas. I'm just I just wanted to clarify a bit uh, the landscape here. And we, we tend to spend uh, a bit more time on, on this axis, but maybe being down here or these two here, um, 
maybe gives us more, um, we can scale up faster. So regarding the costs of supervision, um, there's different costs for each uh, collection method. And for example, you can go from autonomous play, meaning that there's a robot that is playing unsupervised and basically collecting free data for you. Um, you could also have humans playing through data operation, uh, playing with robots and uh, collecting uh, pretty cheap data. Um, next, you could also do demonstrations where you ask humans to do a specific task. And this is more expensive, more like medium cost, because the human has to stage the, the scene, uh, maybe segment the scene and put a label on what's happening. And the most expensive uh, one is to label specific frames or videos, ask maybe humans to type in some uh, object class or language. And so this is kind of like a picture of collection costs. And there's nothing wrong with any of these. Uh, but the point I'm making here is that we want to use these in proportion to their cost. So the cheapest should be the biggest uh, amount of data that you're using. And the second, the, the cheap one, the human play is maybe the second most data that you have. And it's totally fine to use uh, supervised data as long as you only use a really tiny fraction of it. So in this talk, we're going to show exactly that. We're going to make use of all of these, uh, these four um, types of data, but we're gonna respect this uh, proportion uh, of cost. And I'm arguing that this is what makes, uh, makes all of this scalable. Additionally, because this is a self-supervised uh, workshop about self-supervision, um, I want to make the point that uh, self-supervision techniques, uh, similar to the ones used in language and vision, can be successfully applied uh, to robotics control, as we'll show here. Um, for example, here we on the right we have a planning space, a latent planning space for control that is using a VAE-like approach and we're able to recover uh, semantic clusters of experience. So for example, all these little plans of robotic uh, control um, cluster to, to the same uh, semantic uh, task of opening a drawer or closing a drawer, for example. And these emerge naturally without us using any labels. Um, and that's a Disney space. So um, my point is that this is encouraging that Self-supervision does work across many domains and we should maybe not um, separate the video and control and uh, language too much. It, this should all be learned with just one model and reuse the same techniques across the different uh, domains. So the outline of this talk is, um, so given our goal of wanting to train a generous robot, a robot that can do uh, any task it wants without training for specific tasks in advance. Um, and we, we want to do this in a scalable way by jointly learning control vision language. Given this goal, we're, I'm going to present these three projects that each um, push towards that big goal. And the first one is learning from play where we're gonna, gonna ask the question, uh, how do we acquire uh, skills and control and vision in a scalable fashion. Uh, the second is learning to play by imitating humans, meaning that we want to automate the play collection so that we can scale up the data acquisition again. And finally, how do we also scale up the language acquisition uh, so that we can follow instructions, uh, but also learn from you know, both language and play at the same time and get the benefits of both. So the first topic, learning from play. Uh, this is a paper that was uh, presented last year at Coral 2019. Um, so the highlight of this work is that we're, we ask your people to play, to, to tailor operate the robot and play with the robot and, and then see if we can uh, perform tasks from that. And we were able to uh, perform many tasks without uh, ever specifying 
task in advance. There is no use of task labels whatsoever in this work. We don't use any rewards. There's no RL. Um, and we, we can do multiple tasks in a row in zero shot um, and get this 85% accuracy on uh, 18 discrete tasks. Uh, so let's explore uh, the recipe here, which is using self supervision on top of play there. Um, so the first thing to recognize to make things uh, scalable is that robotic tasks are not, or even tasks in general, even for humans, are not discrete things. We may sometimes think of them as discrete, but if you think of opening this door uh, to the right, there are many ways you can do that. You can uh, you know, move slowly, push with one finger, finger, push halfway, and then uh, keep pushing another way. Um, so there's lots of variations around uh, one. You can think of one task, but there's actually so many variations that um, you could call all of these uh, with different words. And same here, do you, um, at the bottom, do you, do you say that you fully close that thing or you just uh, partially close this? Um, so how do we, um, is there really a boundary be between tasks? Uh, not really, we're arguing for learning a continuum of skills. It's really a, a continuous latent space that you should learn. And all of these um, tasks, they have, um, it's kind of like an iceberg where you, you can think of these discrete tasks as maybe um, the tip of the iceberg, but this is a huge mass under that is all these little variations and even transitions between between these, these tasks. So how do we cover the continuum? So one thing you can do is uh, do a scripted collection of robot, the robot it has a script, and then you, uh, you train this with RL, uh, but this, this is so much uh, work to define a reward. Um, it really doesn't scale that well. Uh, you also have to reset, you have to engineer a reward, you have to distribute that. So it's really uh, difficult. Uh, another way is to do learning from demonstrations where you ask people to show you multiple tasks, um, predetermined tasks, but that, that also uh, is not really scalable because you have to predefine these tasks. So instead, we're proposing to learn from play, and play has this kind of uh, property of covering a really broad uh, set of things that you can do because play is really, it's just a, a broad exploration of the space. Um, and because we, you don't need to predefine tasks, then uh, it just gives you this continu continuum of, of skills. Um, so we think that's the right way to scale, to scale up. And I explain, I'll show more why. So first, here's an example of uh, what play data looks like. Um, so this is human playing VR, controlling the, the arm, moving the, the, the arm around. And you can see that, you know, we can collect this big um, uh, experience of many hours and it's one big stream of experience that is really not uh, stopped or segmented at any time. Um, and here the um, operators are, are just asked, they're not asked any particular specific task, they're just asked to do as many things as they can think of and like as diverse data as possible. Um, so manipulating the objects in all the ways possible. Um, so this is about three hours of data that we have. And now, so now we're getting this big uh, chunk of data. How, how can, we, can we learn to do tasks uh, just from this really un unlabeled uh, data set? Um, so if you think of, uh, if you take random windows of play experience, you can consider the first, uh, let's say, typically we're going to take one or two seconds, uh, a window, a random window of play. You can take the first frame as a start, as a current. And you can take the last frame of that window as the goal. Uh, and because you know the actions that were taken, um, this is a, a hindsight goal. So we, after the fact, we say, okay, this, we've observed this, but this is your goal, really. Uh, and because of this, we can just learn a policy that given the current the start position and this goal, 
state uh, is going to train to output that series of actions, that particular series of action. And this is how we're going to train uh, our play model. And now if you do this on all the random windows of your data set, you end up with this really broad coverage where you can go from uh, you know, almost any point to any point in that space. And that's, that's what covers the continuum of skills. And um, the, the efficiency of this approach is, comes from the fact that we can really slide. We have the sliding win window where we take random windows and we, we slide it on the whole data set. And it's the same thing. It's the same reason why convolutional networks are efficient, because you can reuse all the steps. So if you take, for example, if you take uh, 60 seconds of data, the, the sliding is going to blow up the data into 600 unique sequences, which is actually three hours, more than three hours of data. Um, so this is one uh, important aspect of scalability. And note that this, this is not possible to do that if you have a specific demonstration, segmented de demonstration. So this is why this long uh, um, continuous collection is really important and scalable. Um, so of course, uh, you know, there's multiple ways you can go from A to B. So you have to handle uh, multi-model. Multi there's a multi-model problem here um, to learn. And th this is also showing you like, you know, all these ways you can go from the, that first state of the door being closed to open. There are all these ways, and and these are covered by the play. The play data really covers that space for you, uh, somewhat for free, without really any design behind it. All right. So to train this model, so again, we take a random window that has a video. There's a, a video here, and we have actions that come with it when the person plays, and. Um, the way we're going to self-supervise on this is by learning two models. The first is the um, plan proposal, where it is it takes as input the current uh, image and the goal image. And it's trying to produce a distribution um, that encodes a plan. It's a latent plan. And at the same time, we also have a, sec a second encoder that takes the whole sequence, the whole video, and it's going to output a point in a space that is really going to, it's a distribution that represents that particular sequence. So the plan proposal is a, is a family of ways to do something, but the plan recognition is that particular, particular sequence. And we use a KL divergence minimization to, have, to make, this, make sure these two points are close to each other. Um, and this is what does the self supervision. So once they are close to each other, then we can treat um, this point in space as a distribution from which we, we can sample. So if I only if I if now I get rid of this plan recognition, um, I have my uh, goal uh, latent plan I can sample from, and feed that into an action decoder. Um, and so given the current the goal and the plan which the plan kind of means how I'm going to perform that action. Um, now I can tra train to uh, output with supervised, supervised learning to output the actions that I've observed during uh, the collection. Um, so this architecture is kind of like a VAE. Um, this is where the self-supervision comes from. And this is where the semantic arrangement kind of emerges naturally. At test time, we're, the way we use this is um, given the goal state, so we have uh, this goal image here. So for example, here we want to press the button. Um, and we have the current um, image that goes at one hertz. Um, we feed, feed that to the plan proposal, and that gives us a plan distribution. From that distribution, we la uh, sample a latent plan at one hertz, and we feed that to the action decoder. The action decoder is running at 30 hertz and outputs uh, action at 30 hertz in closed loop. So now, as long as you have your goal image here, you can just run this, and it can actually perform the actions in a sequence. So to evaluate that, we um, we 
could choose 18 tasks that we could think of. Um, so for example, closing the drawer, uh, sliding the door, grasping the objects, knocking the objects, pulling the object out of the shelf, pressing the buttons. Um, what else? Rotate the objects, sweep the object into the, the drawer. And so this, this is a, the benchmark we're going to evaluate our, um, uh, our model, our policy on. And so we find that, um, so we obtain this uh, single policy that's really task agnostic. It's never seen any, any label regarding this 18 task. Uh, it's never been told by this task. And when we run that, uh, we obtain 85% accuracy in zero shot because it hasn't seen this, this task. Um, the baseline we use is something that is actually given um, demos of these specific tasks and trained just on that. And this actually does worse. And especially when you perturb, perturb the, the starting position, it is it, not as robust. So, so these two curves represent the play, the models train on play, and they are much more robust than the ones trained on specific demos. Uh, so not only does better, it's also more robust to train on play instead of specific demonstrations. Uh, here, here are some uh, example of um, how it works. On the left, you have uh, this goal image. And the goal here is to slide that uh, door. And uh, the policy takes that as goal and just is able to do that, do that task. You can also compose skills. So you can first give that image of opening a drawer and then putting the object into the drawer. And it does these two skills in the sequence. We can also do that uh, with eight skills. So this is an example of uh, this goal, then this goal of pressing the button. Strongly a bit here. Okay, then pressing green, pressing blue, and then closing the door, opening the door, opening drawer, putting the object in the drawer, closing drawer. And as I showed before, if 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 we do a Disney of that latent space, we actually end up finding that the the latent plans they do cluster together by semantics. So all the green points are button pushing tasks, uh, yellow are grasping. And these are things we just label by hand just to see what's in there. Um, but th this is kind of uh, showing that you do get this continuous space of skills. They're not, you know, this is still continuous and not really discrete. Um, and again, this iceberg ID where, you know, this, this is, these are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of discrete skills that we can think of. But there's this big mass of skills that uh, we wouldn't have been able to sit down and write before. Uh, and this probably represents, you know, um, maybe there could be transitions between different skills or just variations of, of these or even things that we haven't thought about. So this is um, kind of a picture of why this is scalable. And, um, and compared to other approaches, so um, if you do scripted collection with RL, again, this is scalable. You can get lots of data, but the data won't be that interesting. If you do LFD, you will get rich data, but it won't be as scalable. And so uh, learning from play is kind of getting both uh, rich and also really scalable data. So that, that was our answer to um, scaling up learning of control. And, and also, we also backdrop to vision. I didn't say that, but uh, we also learn, learn vision from scratch there. Um, so both uh, control and vision here uh, is learned in a scalable way with cheap data. Um, and multimodal, because we have both action and vision. Now, a, another way to scale this up even more is instead of learning from play, we can learn to play by imitating human play. Uh, this is a um, paper that uh, just came out. It's just it's going to be presented at RSS 2020 next month. And here, um, the goal is to, as I mentioned before, you know, scale up uh, using autonomous play because it's free. 
um, in a similar fashion to this, this is an example of a human agent that is exploring all these uh, object interactions and um, getting lots of data from these objects entirely by itself without any supervision. So this is what we would like to get to scale up to huge, huge amounts of data for free. And towards that, that goal, um, we our first the first results we have is something like this, where this is the robot playing by itself without supervision, without us asking the robot to do anything specific. Uh, so we can see that it does perform semantically meaningful tasks. So interacting with the object, interacting with the door, it was pressing the buttons earlier. Um, so this allows us to scale up the data even more. So that's that's another answer to the question of how do we scale up video learning um, by just creating our uh, that ourselves. And um, so obviously this is not as advanced as the one on the left. Um, but this this uh, new data was uh, allowed us to actually improve the results, as I'm going to show now. So the how does it work? So we have again we have the same uh, uh, approach of humans uh, seeding the data set with some human play. So here we had 32 minutes, and from these 32 minutes we learn a behavior cloning model um, that is able to. This is just learning um, the distribution. Um, of actions that, given the current state, what are the likely, what is the distribution of, distribution of likely actions that I have observed when a human is playing? Uh, so once I learn that, I can just unroll this policy um, for as long as I want to. So in, in this case, we actually run like uh, we generated one minute of play at a time, uh, little chunks of one minute, and so we let the robot play, and it, you can end up we chose uh, to use 10 hours of play data. So we seed with 32 minutes and we end up with 10 hours of play. And if you just train on this human uh, data, then our 18 tasks, we do 65% accuracy. But now if you train on both, both these data sets, we actually get a 10% boost. Uh, so we actually benefited uh, in accuracy here. So it does work. And so one question you might ask is, um, aren't you going to repeat uh, twice, you know, what you've seen during training here, aren't you going, going to repeat that here? Um, and this this might be the case if you if your problem was like, like a 2D maze, but in this 3D environment with uh, multiple things you can do, the space is actually uh, growing up really quickly. So. It's so high dimensional that it's actually uh, really unlikely that you're gonna do the, exactly the same thing twice. And and this is actually illu illustrating that um, in a quantitative way, where here we have um, a measure of the the covering of the st of the state space. So the higher you go, the more you've covered uh, the interaction space. And on the x-axis is uh, the amount of data that we collected. So in the zoom in part here, we have, you have the blue curve is just a human play. It's a half an hour. The human play is um, covering a lot of ground in terms of the, the play space, um, the interaction space. And it's, it's, uh, it's getting rich uh, data quickly. And after, after this half hour, we start collecting by ourselves and the, the it's not as steep, so you, you don't get as, as uh, interesting data as fast, but it still, it does keep growing uh, sublinearly uh, to the point that after 130 hours, uh, you get this uh, around 100,000 um, uh, discrete states that we can measure as opposed to, it was like 3,000 for human play. Um, so another question that may arise is, can't you just do random actions? What will happen then? So on the right, um, you see what happens 
in terms of this is the 18 task success uh, starting at 65. If you keep adding uh, new autonomous data, um, how does the performance uh, go uh, as you add more data? So if you do random actions, actually the performance degrades uh, after 10 hours, you're like towards 50%. But if you add uh, the autonomous play instead, it actually keeps going up to 75%. Um, so random actions uh, do not help, they hurt. Okay, these are um, more qualitative examples of the robot playing by itself. Um, so intuitively it doesn't you know, look maybe as natural as humans. I mean, sometimes it does, but not always. Um, but it still performs um, sensible and functional actions. So it's still useful. Uh, here are some failure examples uh, on the left. For example, we have uh, this robot ends up getting out of frame, so exploring the rest, which is we haven't really done that before. Uh, so you don't. This is not really useful. Uh, and here it's still doing sensible stuff, but not exactly uh, really doing that in interesting interesting data. So it's not always that good. Um, but we still get this 10% this, uh, boost. Okay, so uh, finally, the, the last uh, part of this talk is how do we, how do we uh, jointly learn from play and language? And this is a paper that came out a few weeks ago. Um, and here you see the main result where we can just type in a command in a natural language. So this is a live demo where uh, you type in the command here, and then you hit enter, and it moves up here. So what the robot is doing is the blue command. So right now it's opening the drawer, then pick up the objects, put it on the table, close the drawer, uh, move the door left, etc. Um, so how do we? How did we get there? How do we? Do, how did we manage to combine language and play? in a scalable fashion. Um, so again, uh, the, the objective for us is to learn one, one robot that can do many tasks that are not specified in advance. Uh, so single agents, many tasks, and onboard sensors only. So video and uh, force feedback. Um, so one aspect of generality that is not often discussed is uh, task conditioning. So um, how, do, how can users specify a task in a way that's both flexible and intuitive? Typically, um, we may have used like a task ID, like one hot encoding of task ID or a goal image to solve a task. And this is trivial to provide if you have a simulator, but in the real world, uh, this is uh, re uh, not that practical. Um, so in, th in this work, we focus on providing that flexible um, task conditioning by having humans just describe the, the task with natural language. And uh, we think this uh, type of conditioning is going to be really important for uh, open world uh, settings for robotics. And, and this is a really broad research setting because um, so just to solve one of these tasks, you actually need to understand uh, Perception, control, and language all at once. Um, so this is really interesting uh, research uh, setting. And, and we're not just interested to do that for one task, but for many. So that's even more um, um, complex. And this is why scalability is, uh, is extremely important here and self-supervision. So the approach. Uh, we take is to pair human language with play windows. So as before, we have play data, we take all the windows possible, one or two seconds, and we label the last frame as the goal image. Uh, so this is the, the same setup as I described before for play, we end up with this play data set that has as paired actions and the goal image, or state, state actions and the goal image. Now, to introduce language, uh, we're going to use um, 
uh, crowd, crowdsourcing approach by asking people to answer, to look at these random windows and answer the question, how do I go from start to finish? And for example, in this uh, sequence here, they might answer by saying, open the door. And they're just going to type in that sentence. Um, and so we call this hindsight in instruction, um, meaning that the instruction is, is given after the fact. It's not if we decided to first type in the sentence and then try to get the corresponding video, corresponding video, this would be extremely difficult. But doing it after the fact is what makes it scalable. So this is our way of, of getting scalable language uh, pairing. And now the same way we get this data set, we can get also a pair of state actions and language. And on the right, you can see an example of that data. So uh, people would typically see one sequence and they would type in that sentence here. So for example, slowly move the door all the way to the left, move your hand towards the drawer handle, roll the block to the left and grasp the block, roll the block towards left, lift the object and move the object left, press and release the red button. Um, so these are sentences that people typed. We didn't really, we didn't ask anyone to, to type in anything specific. It's really uh, unconstrained natural language collection. And it's important to realize that the ratio of data that we use, we need it here to make things work is really small. We actually, here we use less than 1%, 0.1% actually even less than that. Um, so it's really mostly learning skills from this uh, unlabeled play data set. And this tiny amount of language pairing is enough to uh, do the, all the tasks I showed before. So again, we're still respecting this um, uh, ratio of supervision costs here. So this is supervised collection, but because you only need uh, so little, then it's OK, as I was showing in the slides at the beginning. So the, now this, not, once, you, once you have this, this data set, the second step is how do we learn from that? Um, so what we're going to do is, uh, because we want to learn a single uh, agent, uh, we're going to have this multi-context uh, imitation learning where um, this one uh, goal condition policy uh, can take in a state as input and a goal. And the goal here um, is going to be specified um, in multiple ways. So this is a zoom in of that uh, part here. But uh, we call this multi-context imitation, where this one policy has a latent goal, uh, which is a shared uh, goal representation space between different types of data sets. So if you have a goal image, for example, then you just feed that to your image encoder, uh, like your goal image encoder, and it, this gives you a goal image. If you have a demonstration of a specific task, you fill in the task ID, and that's another way to get to that space. Or if you have language description, that's another way. So this is a really a way to use, uh, to, to learn from all these various sources of goal conditioning. Uh, and they all are trained in the same space, so that that's space is shared. Um, and this way, you can learn from all of these at the same time. We have uh, concurrent loops uh, learning from either image or language into the same model. Um, and at test time, you can decide, you can, you can uh, specify the condition policy on either language or task ID. Um, and so this is how we're going to learn from our both our 99% of robotic experience and our 1% of language uh, pairing. And as before, we, we train uh, the same way as it was described before, we train to produce the next action. Um, So finally, okay, let me go back to the end. So finally, the way we use this, uh, we end up having this goal condition policy, and but we actually just uh, specify the goal with sentences. So we just type in instructions, uh, and the model sees the current image. Um, and again, we backprop through all of these. So we learn uh, the visions from scratch here. Um, 
we learned both the language and the vision from scratch through all these uh, multi-context uh, paths. And at test time, we can just type in a, a type type in a instruction. The robot sees the current image and then produces the next action. And we just loop uh, in the closed loop here. Um, so some experiments uh, around this is um, we we compared uh, using videos or just using states. We compare between using a, a, a sentence as a goal or just an image as a goal. And similar as before, we use the 18 task benchmark. Um, or we also have this uh, chain four, which is a chain of, of, of four tasks in a row, and which uh, yields, yields 90, uh, 925 unique combination of tasks. So there's really many tasks here we're evaluating. And you can see example here. So this is the, by the way, the onboard, uh, this is uh, pixel inputs to the model. This is what the robot sees. And it, it sees the, um, the command here as well. Uh, so these are examples of us doing multiple tasks in a row. And the, the quantitative results show that um, when you, uh, so, so learning from both play and language is really uh, the, the best model by a big margin. Um, if you just learn on, for example, um, just language, but no play, if you just learn on uh, task demonstrations, um, this model does the worst. So this is around like 10% accuracy. Um, so this tells us that, yeah, in these baselines, we kind of try to decouple uh, each factor. And we find that learning from play is extremely important for the accuracy. Without uh, learning from play, you don't, you, you do really bad. Once you do learning from play, then you, you're back uh, to this 50% uh, regime. Um, if we learn from play, but without language, if we use images as goals, uh, we do as well as if we uh, use language or images as goals. So these are kind of equivalent. Um, so for example, these two. So one is learning from play, one is learning from language and play. And they're about the same same results. Now the interesting, really interesting uh, boost that we got here is by so so first of all, they're about the same results, but one is much much easier to specify at test time. So one of them you just type in a sentence, and you get the the skill. Uh, the other one you have to give give a goal image, so it's extremely hard to get a goal image. Um, but now if you if you start training as well on something we call transfer uh, Lang LFP, if you start from a pre-trained language embedding that's been trained on lots of uh, Wikipedia data, for example, then we get around a 10% boost in accuracy. So here, this is one example of grounding language into play because we had this pre-trained language as I said, it was not, has not seen our data before and has given, um, given us a boost in uh, performing the task. And here is an example of um, um, of doing four tasks in a row. Uh, this one is trained on play, this one is not. And because it's not trained on play, it's not able to get past the first task. Uh, it's able to open the drawer, but because the distribution it, it has seen during training is so narrow, it's not able to transition to other tasks. Whereas play is so broad that it can do that. Um, we are able to do 15, 15 tasks in a row. Uh, this is one example. So pull the drawer all the way, drag the block into the drawer, close the drawer all the way, etc. Uh, so we do all of these in uh, in zero shots, and and these were never determined in advance again. Um, an important point here is that um, learning from play when you scale up the model capacity. If you train on the play data set, then you actually can utilize this capacity very well. Um, but if you train just on, on uh, task demonstrations, you actually don't benefit from that. So from the same, for the same amount of data, uh, it's actually much more beneficial to use a, type, a play type of collection. Uh, we also find that language conditioning is um, interesting in that you can have interactions with from the operator to with the robot. So 
uh, initially here the, the robot is asked to press the red button, but it hasn't um, it hasn't opened the door enough to do it. So th the operator is helping the robot by kind of micromanaging or breaking down the task. Um, so let me show that again. Um, so press the red button. Okay, it's gonna come back to it. Okay, fine, you got it. But the, the initial setup was this. Uh, move the door all the way right. And doesn't quite make it, so it gets stuck against the door. So the operator says move back. So move back to the hand. But then opens the door by accident, so then the operator is going to say close the door. And then move the door right, and then so that you can uh, close the push the button. So this kind of opens up new ways of interaction with robots. Um, and we can also compose a new task. So this is a task that we haven't really uh, evaluated on, but we decided to try it at this time, and it worked. By we could not uh, put the object in the, in the trash directly, but if you break it down into first grasp the object and then put it in the drawer, uh, then we were able to perform this task. And again, and same here, put it on top of the shelf. Again, these these, these are tasks we haven't. Um, we haven't defined any task really. It's uh, the combination of hindsight uh, pairing of language and play has allowed us to do all these things that we haven't prepared for. Um, and because of this uh, pre training of uh, language, so using a multilingual uh, data set actually allowed us to. Even though we only had ten thousand sentences of English uh, English uh, sentences that we train our model on, um, because of we of using this pre-trained on bank space, we can actually enter uh, new sentences in different languages languages that were not part of our collected uh, data sets. Um, but it still works. So so now we can do we can enter sentences in dif uh, sixteen different languages. Uh, and still be able to perform the task with, uh, I think, yeah, around 60%, 60% accuracy in all these 16 languages. So this is an example of knowledge transfer through uh, um, language retraining. This is an example of French, French demo. Um, so sort l'objet du tiroir, ferme le tiroir. Um, this, this, uh, Again, this was never trained on French, but yet we can uh, do these tasks live, uh, typing French sentences. And of course, it doesn't always work, so we have failures where um, you know it's, sometimes it's just not able to pick up objects. Um, and it can be for reasons such as uh, self-occlusion, so maybe the robot doesn't always see um, uh, how far how far it is to the object, or it doesn't have the, the depth information. So these are something to we can uh, work on in the future. Um, so to conclude, um, you know, I want to also I want, I want to motivate the vision community to use uh, more robotics data. So we are actually open sourcing our environments. Um, right now, this this one is available. It doesn't have the play data yet or the robots, but um, you can download this right now. Um, but we have we'll have play data coming soon, um, so I would encourage uh, self-supervised uh, video um, learning to happen more in this kind of environments. Um, and so to summarize, uh, we um, we try to kind of answer the question: Where should video learning, self-supervised video learning, go? And try to mo motivate that to uh, go towards robotics. Uh, because we can capitalize on cheap multi-model signals, and we are able to learn a single model to jointly learn vision control and language. Um, and doing so in a scalable way uh, by, again, using this ratio of uh, cost, collection cost, uh, by using lots of autom autonomous uh, play for free, uh, human play, which is cheap, and demonstrations, which is that cheap, and a tiny amount of language annotation that allowed us to do all these tasks uh, with um, around 80% accuracy. All right, so I guess there's no, this is pre-recorded, so there's no opportunity for questions, but please uh, feel free to send me uh, questions by email. 
And I, I would like to thank all my collaborators uh, at Google uh, for all this work. Thank you.